All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Panopoulos. I'm an application scientist for Flojo at BD. And um, today we're gonna be talking about cell cycle analysis uh, using Flojo V10. And uh, this is a special platform within Flojo itself. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking a little bit um, before we actually jump into Flojo, I'll be talking a little bit about cell cycle, what the cytometer, um, you know, how, how we detect cell cycle phases using the cytometer and some other specifics about the cell cycle um, and cell cycle analysis uh, before we begin the experiment or before we get into Flojo proper. And then if you guys have any questions um, during today's session, what I recommend that you do is either use the Q&A box or the chat box to enter your questions. Um, and I will stop and read those questions from time to time and try to answer them as best as I can. So I see that someone has already written in that box. Uh, good morning, Erwin. Uh, I'm going to write to everybody and just say good morning. And you can type your questions here, something like that. And so what will happen now is when I hit enter, that should, you know, light up on your side, on your screen, in your Zoom frame, you should be able to see um, the box kind of light up for the chat box. For me, the chat box is the easiest one to monitor, although, as I said, I will monitor both the Q&A and the chat boxes. So any uh, anyone that you wish to, to use, uh, we will, um, I'll, I'll get to it. So let me go ahead and just maximize, um, do the you know the full uh, slideshow here, and I will use a laser pointer, and let's see if we can't navigate to the next um, slide. Yeah, there it is. A laser pointer is working. Sometimes with Zoom, there's some hiccups with some of the specialties in PowerPoint, but in any case, um, the cell cycle. Uh, if you're not familiar or haven't done any cell cycle work, or maybe you're new to um, doing cell cycle work, you know, using a flow cytometer or just new to biology in general, um, it, it's important to know that the cells go through several different stages before or while they proliferate. <clears throat> so these stages can be roughly divided into four major ones known as uh, G1 or the gap, gap phase one. And then you have S phase, this is for DNA synthesis. Then you have gap phase two. And then ultimately uh, you have uh, mitosis and mitosis is even broken up into further um, stages where the chromosomes essentially align along the metaphase plate and then you know get, um, uh, get pulled to one side or the other during uh, telophase and then cytokinesis when the cells actually uh, split off from one another. So generally speaking, dur during G1, there is no DNA replication. This is just a phase of the cell cycle where the cells are acquiring the requisite amount of energy and other materials needed <clears throat> to enter into uh, DNA synthesis phase. Um, and then once you're in, usually there's a, I should mention, there's usually a restriction point or a checkpoint that occurs between G1 and S uh, to make sure that essentially we have all of the necessary components to move forward. Um, and then that will, you know, eventually move us into the next phase where DNA synthesis occurs. And once we exit the S phase, all of the DNA has been replicated. So you now have twice the number of chromosomes that you did um, in the beginning. And you go through a second gap phase where again, you're acquiring the necessary uh, biomolecules to enter into the mitotic, uh, mitotic phase. And there is a G2 checkpoint as well before we enter into uh, mitosis. There are a bunch of checks to make sure that the integrity of the DNA is um, intact before we actually begin um, you know, divvying up the uh, the chromosomes. And so this is a highly regulated, uh, highly regulated process. And as the image on the right kind of infers, you can see that there's lots of different proteins that are playing a role in all of these transitions. But the primary ones that are leading us from one phase to the other are usually uh, 
uh, a bunch of uh, proteins known as cyclins, which bind to and generally activate cyclin-dependent kinases. And then these cyclin-dependent kinases act on other uh, intracellular proteins to either phosphorylate them or, you know, interact with them in such a way that it pushes them uh, to do their, you know, to do their next function in the, uh, in the cell cycle. And so, for example, here in prior to, uh, prior to G1 or prior to S phase, cyclin uh, uh, CDK4 and cyclin D usually bind with one another and uh, phosphorylate the protein called RB. And then uh, RB, once it becomes hyperphosphorylated, it gets degraded, and this releases the E2F transcription factor to enter into the nucleus and then <clears throat> upregulate genes that are involved with S phase entry. So I see there's already a couple of questions um, here. So um, Yeah, there's uh, so Aaron, this is being uh, this is being recorded. So after um, after today's session, it will actually be posted to our uh, website today. Um, so it's entirely up to you if you want to do a secondary Zoom recording on top of this, but um, it's already being recorded, and everyone will have access um, to this recording whether or not you have uh, even attended today's session. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, you know, once we get into S phase, there are other cyclins um, involved with exit from S phase and entry into uh, mitosis, et cetera. This generally uh, is being controlled by cyclin E and cyclin dependent kinase two. Um, and then eventually we get into M phase and the whole process um, again repeats. This, even though this image may look a little bit complicated, um, there are actually more proteins that are involved in this process than this than this image shows. And this was a paper, you know, was taken from a paper that was published more than 20 years ago. So we have definitely more information um, today. But I just thought this was a really good um, diagram to kind of, you know, detail the complexities. That go on during the during the different transitions of each of those uh, phases of the cell cycle. Okay, so let's advance to the next slide and see if this works without me having to like end the show and then use uh, you know the arrow key. So apparently I have to push on the arrow on the the PowerPoint in order to move because it doesn't do it automatically from my keyboard. So in any case. <clears throat> When we try to do this, uh, measure these phases um, using cytometry, the figure on the right kind of shows you the, what we will actually see. And normally what we do in a cytometry experiment where we're looking at different phases of the cell cycle, we're usually just staining for, uh, you know, with some sort of DNA intercalating agent like, um, you know, Huxt or perhaps DAPI. Um, there are PI, right? Propidium iodide is another one. Um, uh, AAD, or, or sorry, not 7AAD. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's correct. 7AAD is a, is a DNA intercalating dye. I'm getting it mixed up with AARD, which is a uh, live dead dye that uh, permeates the cells, but it doesn't intercalate into the DNA. But in any case, we normally stain with some sort of um, DNA intercalating dye, and then we measure that uh, amount of that dye present in the cells. And so what the histogram sees or what it, what you will see as a result of interrogating the data that uh, is acquired on the cytometer is you usually get a histogram that has a fairly large peak for the uh, cells that are in uh, G1 phase. And we say that they're in G1 simply because the DNA content here is going to be half that of the cells that are in G2. And then you normally will see some sort of I don't know, not usually a smooth curve, but it's usually kind of jagged um, where you look at the uh, S phase cells. So these are cells that have more than half of the DNA content, but less than the full complements. So you could think of this, if you're talking about mammalian cells, this would be, you know, 2N DNA over here. And then at G2M, this would be 
four in uh, DNA, and then anything in between here would be somewhere between two and four in. Okay, but notice that the cytometer can really only distinguish between the G1, S, and G2 phases of the cell cycle. In fact, what it considers the G2 can actually include uh, mitotic phase cells. In the absence of any other marker that shows you that the cells are actually in mitosis, um, the amount of DNA is exactly the same. And so we cannot with one dimension, we cannot distinguish between G2 and M phases unless we include another marker. And another thing too, is that cells have this G0 phase. Generally speaking, this G0 phase is only found in primary cells. So not any of the transformed cell lines that you might have in the lab or the immortalized cell lines like you know HEC293s or HEP-G2s, et cetera. All of those cell lines for the most part do not have G0 phases. They just go through this cycle and constantly turn and constantly turn because they're always proliferating. But human primary cells and other primary cells from other animals um, have the capability of entering into G0. And in fact, most of our cells are in the G0 stage, which is said to be like a you know, quiescent state where they perform all the normal cellular functions, uh, metabolism and so forth, but they do not proliferate. And um, they only proliferate when certain extracellular signals are encountered or, you know, on, on, a, um, on occasion, you know, obviously if we're, we're, you know, transducing the cells with some sort of viral construct we can actually get them to march into the interface of the, uh, of the cell cycle. But G0 is another phase that is not um, distinguishable when we use only one marker for measuring the, uh, the DNA content, for example, of the, of the cells. So if you want to see G0, uh, we have to use uh, at least one other marker in order to be able to determine the difference between G0 and uh, G1 cells, okay? So it's important, very important to note and uh, design your um, experiments uh, accordingly. So this slide just recounts what I just told you. Okay, that we need additional markers for G0 or M phase if we want to specifically identify those particular populations. Okay, in terms of controls, I talked to a lot of people about their uh, you know, cell cycle analysis. I've done a lot of um, a lot of sort of consulting work, if you will, uh, on a, and I've talked to people about their experiments and I'm really kind of surprised at how many people lack appropriate controls for their experiments. And so I, I just want to reiterate the fact that anytime you run any kind of experiment, whether it's cytometry or otherwise, we always need controls because that is the basis for comparison. How can we say that, you know, experimental uh, experiment variable one is actually um, responsible for some sort of effect that we see in our study? if we don't have a control for that particular experimental variable. So we always need controls. Um, in particular for cell cycle analysis, we can have different sets of controls that help us identify different stages of the cell cycle. And as I mentioned, you know, what we're gonna get in the end from the cytometer usually is a histogram. And we're gonna have to be able to determine on that histogram where each peak happens to lie, right? Where is the G1? phase, where is the S phase, and where is the uh, G2 phase of the uh, cell cycle. So having additional controls is important for all kinds of cell cycle studies that we do. Cell synchronization is particularly important because when you synchronize the cells, distinguishing between G1 and S phase can be very difficult. And so it's important to include a G1 control that shows you the strict boundary between G1 and S phase. Okay. Drug treatments, a lot of times, if you treat your cells with uh, different types of drugs, whether or not they are cell cycle inhibiting, a lot of times they can perturb the cell cycle. And again, you get some very strange distributions. And again, being able to identify uh, 
whether these strange distributions are actually, you know, affecting the S phase or G2. Um, it's important to have controls that show you exactly where those stages begin and end, and then you can uh, evaluate what the drug treatment is doing. Same thing for any kind of uh, knockdown or knockout experiments um, where you are looking at the cell cycle um, activity. If you don't have the proper controls in place, a lot of times it's difficult to say exactly where that shRNA or where that knockdown is actually occurring. Okay, so there's a question here about can you name some of these markers for M phase or G0? Yes, um, I, Patricia, I'm going to mention these. I have a slide. Um, it's not comprehensive, but it'll definitely get to some of the markers that you are uh, asking about. So I have it in this slide deck and we'll get there very shortly here. Okay, for the controls, um, as I mentioned, uh, you need to have multiple controls, and especially since we're doing Flow cytometry, we always, always, always need to have an unstained tube of cells. You should also have single stain controls, regardless of whether compensation needs to be run or not. So you should just have, you know, your DNA stain. And if you have other stains that you're including in the experiment, make sure that you have single stains for each of those. Um, you should always have a tube with random cycling cells or vehicle treated cells so that you can kind of see what the uh, normal distribution of your cells ought to be. And then when, you know, you treat your cells with some sort of um, drug, you can see what, what that does to that uh, random cycling distribution. Uh, I emphasize here G1 controls, um, inhibitors for G1, um, especially for immortalized or transformed cells, because the G1 phase and the S phase of those uh, cells a lot of times can run together and being able to distinguish between the two phases of the cell cycle is difficult unless you have an inhibitor um, that prevents uh, S phase entry, for example. And I'll talk about those inhibitors here momentarily. Um, G2 controls are particularly important for primary cells. So if you're doing an analysis on PBMC, or some other primary cell line that, or, or primary cells that you're getting from, let's say, an animal. Um, oftentimes, you know, primary cells don't proliferate very well, and therefore, you know, the G2 peak can be a mystery. And um, although you can, you know, you can roughly estimate it, right, by doubling the uh, the G1 peak, it's always nice to have a G2 control where you can tell exactly where that's. Uh, G2 peak ought to be. So another question here real quick. All right, yeah, so I'll get to this. I think it's the next slide, uh, Patricia. Well, close, we're very close. It's only 11 slides long, so don't worry. Uh, I'll get there very shortly. Okay, and it's important also to note that um, certain cell cycle distributions, when you're working with immortalized or transformed uh, mammalian cell lines, a lot of times you'll get a distribution that looks something like this, where you have the vast majority of your cells, well, the vast majority, I should just say the majority of your cells are in G1, but there's a large proportion of them that are in S phase and in G2 or uh, M phases of the, of the cell cycle, right? Because immortalized or transformed cell lines continuously proliferate in culture, even if the plates get, you know, even if you're using adherent cells and the plates get pretty confluent, um, the, the cells a lot of times will still continue to proliferate. Um, when you look at primary mammalian cells, on the other hand, you'll notice that the vast majority of cells here are locked um, in either G0 or G1. Now, I would normally think that primary cells are actually in G0, but again, we can't distinguish without additional markers what the G0 phase of the cell cycle um, would be. And then you'll have very few cells that are actually in S phase or uh, G2 uh, phase of the cell cycle. So just be aware of that when you're studying, you know, when you look at the, the experimental setup that you have, know what you should expect as distributions so that when you analyze your cells, you know whether or not you are, um, you're on track. Okay, so here's a list of some um, inhibitors that you could use as controls to identify different uh, stages of the cell cycle. When I was a postdoc and grad student, I used to use L-mimosine a lot, which is a G1 phase inhibitor. It would uh, block the cells just before they got into S phase. Uh, 
mechanism of action is kind of unknown, um, but it worked well uh, when I was using uh, transform uh, cell lines and uh, primary cells as well. Uh, Aphidicolin is an S phase inhibitor, but again, it, it inhibits cells in early S phase. It's a Paul Delta, DNA Paul's Delta inhibitor. Thymidine block is a very age old method. It's very inexpensive. You just dump a bunch of excess thymidine on top of the cells. This will block them in uh, S phase. So again, just before the cells enter into S phase, if they have too much a glut of thymidine, they will not enter into, uh, into S phase. Uh, nogatazole and colchicine are both mitotic inhibitors. They inhibit microtubules. So nogatazole forces depolymerization of the microtubules. So you can't actually form uh, a metaphase plate. And of course, then you can't go into anaphase when you pull the uh, when you pull the chromosomes apart. So the cells are sort of stuck in this um, pro prolonged um, prophase, basically. And then uh, colchicine does the opposite of nicotazole. Um, it polymerizes microtubules and pre prevents them from being able to, um, to depolymerize. And so you get essentially stuck with cells that are in uh, a quasi metaphase state, right? The chromosomes may be aligned, but they they can't uh, be separated or or moved around very easily. Uh, taxol is another one that acts like colchicine, and then you have some other inhibitors uh, like camptothecan and uh, etoposide. They both are DNA topoisomerase uh, inhibitors, and they uh, affect. Uh, mitosis or M phase because they basically they induce DNA damage. So these latter two were never my favorite um, inhibitors for working um, with, uh, you know, when trying to lock cells in a particular stage of the cell cycle. Uh, the ones, uh, I guess the first six or the first five are much cleaner. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many other um, inhibitors of the cell cycle, for example, that target the different cyclin-dependent kinases or the cyclins themselves, you can use those to also inhibit uh, the cell cycle. Okay, in terms of additional markers, so I mentioned that if you want to be able to detect phases like G0 or specifically M phase cells, there are markers like MPM2, which targets mitotic phosphorylated proteins. Um, this will uh, very easily detail cells that are in M phase versus G2. Uh, if you want to uh, identify cells that are strictly in S phase, BRDU or EDU have been around for a very long time. There are thymidine analogs um, that inc get incorporated into the nascent DNA. And uh, in the case of BRDU, there's an antibody uh, that is usually conjugated to uh, like Alexa 488 or something similar. Um, that, that will target the, this particular analog, but does not react with, um, with thymidine. Um, and then EDU uses a click chemistry where you basically covalently bind a fluorescent tag to the presence um, wherever this EDU happens to be in the, uh, the DNA chain. So it's a pretty cool method of easily detecting S phase cells. I'll talk about some other S phase um, markers here uh, before we get into talking about G0, but PCNA, proliferating cell nuclear antigen is another one. This is a protein that's expressed in cells during S phase, very useful marker for S phase cells. Uh, also KI67 is an S phase, uh, S phase cell protein and it marks them uh, quite well as well. Now, as far as, um, G0 is concerned. G0 is a little bit more difficult to identify. And what people have done in the past is they've used either acridine orange or pyronin Y. And these dyes will actually stain um, RNA uh, or single stranded, uh, single stranded DNA. And what you do is you basically look at the ratio of DNA to RNA uh, to figure out whether or not the cells are actually in G1 versus G0 phase. So cells that are quiescent or senescent uh, 
tend to express less RNA and therefore your pyronin Y staining goes down in cells that are in G0, uh, but it's cells that are in G1 that are actively transcribing things, the pyronin Y concentration will actually increase. Um, acridine orange acts in a very similar manner, except that in this case, acridine orange actually binds to both double-stranded DNA and RNA, uh, but it emits light at two different frequencies depending on what it is bound to. So uh, I believe it's a higher frequency that it uh, emits when it's bound to double-stranded DNA, but if it's bound to single-stranded DNA or RNA, it emits at a more far red um, at a more far red uh, spectrum. So if I had my choice, I would probably use pyronin Y just because it's, it's selective for uh, RNA and it's, it doesn't bind um, uh, double-stranded DNA or isn't supposed to anyway. I'm, I'm sure you could probably overload the system and, uh, and get some pyronin Y signal on double-stranded DNA. But in general, this is an RNA, RNA stain. Now, there are some other proteins that are said uh, that were published in a Nature paper, um, I don't know, around 2014, I want to say. I haven't seen these pop up in flow cytometric experiments, but they're proteins that are highly expressed in those phases of the cell cycle, and they seem to be persistent. So uh, PDCD4, which is programmed cell death 4, pretty high, uh, as well as uh, selenium binding protein one. These were both shown in the paper that I reference here to stick around for at least 48 hours after the cells had entered into uh, G0 phase. So I would like to see more papers being published with, or at least, you know, more flow stuff being published with this to see whether or not, you know, people agree that they are useful for uh, flow cytometric determination of G0 phase. But in any case, that's where they are. Here's the references if you're interested um, in, in uh, finding out more. Okay, so that is the end of my um, presentation here in terms of the slide deck. If you guys need technical support, I just post the tech support email here, which is flojo at bd.com. And we'll jump into Flojo proper to do some uh, cell cycle analysis here. So I'll show you how to use uh, these tools. Okay, this particular experiment, we have some control samples here, and then we have some samples that have been treated with some sort of um, cell perturbation agent. I don't know because this was not an experiment that I ran, but um, in any case, the data are pretty good for determining and showing off how to do cell cycle analysis using the cell cycle analysis platform in version 10. Okay, so you normally want to clean up the data, um, get rid of, you know, any debris or doublets before you actually get into the platform itself. And then I would normally start my experiment by looking at a random cycling set of cells um, or any of my um, specific controls that show me where the G1 or G2 phases of the cell cycle are. Okay, once you have the, da uh, the data cleaned up, in my case here, the data are pretty thin. We don't have a ton of different uh, parameters here, as you can see. Um, so all I can really do is isolate the cells away from some of the debris. I can't even do a doublet discrimination here. Uh, but nonetheless, we can still do um, we can do, still do some cell cycle analysis. So I am going to highlight the cleaned up population, the most terminal population, and then I'm going to head up to the tools tab at the top of your screen. So you'll notice that you have these tabs, right? Flojo, file, edit. And as I click on them, you'll notice that the kind of the uh, ribbon underneath kind of changes. And what you wanna be on is the tools tab. You can kind of tell that I'm on it by the highlight on either side of tools. There's a sort of orange bounding uh, lines. And then you'll see the biology band and within which you can find the cell cycle platform. So we click on this button and this will open up another node in Flojo that will attempt to model 
uh, the cell cycle for you. So we use a mathematical model here in this platform to determine the different phases of the cell cycle. Okay, so in my case here, your x-axis should be the color of or the dye that you used for DNA staining. So in my case here, it was DAPI. Um, the axis here should be linear. So a lot of times I'll see people that have, you know, they'll complain that this, um, this model will not calculate. And part of the reason that it won't calculate is because the axis has not been set to linear. So if you collected your DNA stain um, in logs, so if I come back here, for example, and you see DAPI, you see everything here that is in um, a, a linear scale, but you could have data that are collected either in log, right? Or they're presented to you as a bioexponential scale. So you could have something like this, where let's play around with this a little bit and get rid of the, let's get rid of as much as we possibly can here on it. Well, it's not gonna be easy, but try to force this down to the left side of the screen. It doesn't make much sense, but in any case, you can see here how now the model is not calculating what, um, what I have, right? And it's because the data are now in a scale that the platform is not expecting. So the platform wants to see linear data here. So all you have to do to linearize the axis is click the T button and then say linear. And then now we have to come back here. Maybe I should just reset this and this will go back to how it was in the beginning stretches everything back out. And now we can see the different phases of the cell cycle, okay? So if the model can determine um, you know, different phases, you'll see a blue histogram for the G1, you'll see a green one, uh, green histogram here for G2, and then the S phase is usually in this kind of yellow color. If you don't like the colors that Flojo uses here, you can change um, you know, the different uh, phase colors by going to the preferences and you will see, so that's that little heart icon in the upper right. Um, and then you would go to cytometry platforms and you can see here that for cell cycle anyway, you can change the color of the different phases as well as the line that's drawn for the sum of the data. Okay, so when we look at this platform here, when we look at the, in the, when we look at this actual display, you'll notice that there's a bunch of data that are in gray and they're sort of outlined by this black line, right? And then you have uh, inside that gray line, usually you will see the blue histogram and that is bounded on the outside by a nice pink line. So the pink line shows you what the mathematical model is using um, or producing, right? So anything that falls within that pink line is essentially what the mathematical model is doing. Anything that is underneath the black line is describing actually the, that's the raw data. That's the actual data that you have present, okay? So <clears throat> down below, if Flojo calculates this right away, you'll get a number of uh, different statistics that you see below the graph itself. So you'll have a value here called the root mean squared distance or RMSD. I'll talk about this one in a moment, but perhaps more familiar statistics are gonna be the percentage G1, right? The percent S phase and the percent G2. So this is just telling you what the percentage of cells are in each of these uh, colored histograms. And then the G1 mean and the G2 mean are just the peak values here that Flojo is finding. So the mean value uh, for G1 is somewhere right around 200, right? 192 something or other. So if I could actually, you know, zoom in here to 192, you would see that the modal value or the value that you see for the peak, um, that's where, uh, that's where 192.53 would be. Um, same thing with the G2, right? We're out almost to 400 someplace. And then the latter four statistics here. So the G1 CV is describing the width of the histogram over here. So you can think of this as a percentage, right? The G1 CV is about 7%. G2 CV is about 6%. And then 
the model will also calculate the number of cells that are sub G1. I would not use this statistic for anything other than telling me, you know, what is what is less than, than G1. This is not the G0 uh, content, okay? Again, we can't tell what is G0 in this model unless we have a second marker. And in that case, had we had the second marker, we wouldn't be using this platform to calculate the different phases of the cell cycle. In fact, I would use the, the, the other markers to determine what my uh, phases are, okay? But since I only have DNA, that's what we're gonna use. And then of course, percent G2, these are the cells that are, you know, it could be doublets, but it could be also uh, polyploid cells that are populating this uh, this field that uh, that is greater than the, uh, the than the G two peak. Okay, so that's what those statistics mean. The RMSD is the measure of how far the the data, the raw data, are right from the actual model. Now, normally, the lower this number is, the better the model fits the actual data. So our goal when we modify the um, constraints on this platform is to get this number pretty much as low as we can, or at least to the point where when we make changes to the model, the amount that the model the, or the RMSD um, changes either up or down is very minimal. So you're basically looking for the inflection point of where the RMSD doesn't swing widely. Okay. So I'm going to expand the menus that we have beneath here, and I'm gonna crunch this up so we can see both of them. There are two. The first one is the model. So you get to choose which type of model you want to use for um, uh, dis you know, describing the different phases of the, uh, of the cells. So the first mathematical model that was published was this one by Watson back in 1979. It's a very simple model, it's subtractive. And the way it works is we just basically have a Gaussian assumption about the G1 distribution. Okay, so we assume a Gaussian distribution of cells that appear here in G1. We also assume a Gaussian distribution of cells that are in G2. So this nice sort of even curve, right? Even on both sides. Um, and then what we do is we add the amount of cells that we have here with the amount of cells that we have in G2. And then we subtract that from the total. And then what's left is the S phase. And so the S phase is just basically fitted via subtraction from the total. So it's a very straightforward, very simple algorithm. And again, published in 1979. Now, one or two years later, Dean Jet Fox came out with their algorithm. They make the same Gaussian assumptions about G1 and G2, but rather than subtracting these two uh, from the total, what they do is they fit the S phase to a polynomial function. So those of you that can remember back in high school algebra, a polynomial looks like, you know, X squared plus XY plus Y squared equals whatever. So that's essentially what the equation looks like that essentially fits this um, S phase. So the nice thing about the Dean Jet Fox is that it tends to be a little bit more flexible with what the S phase quantity um, could be. And so a lot of times this might be useful when you know you have a very large S phase because you locked cells in S phase or you locked cells in G1 and then you release them and you kind of want to partition or follow those cells as they move through um, S phase, the uh, Dean Jet Fox might be more um, helpful for you in, in studying uh, release from S phase block. And on top of that, you can tick the box here that says with uh, S phase uh, sync. And then what this will do is it essentially breaks up your S phase into four equal components, but you can watch how those components um, change uh, over, uh, over time. So the 
flattening out of this S phase will uh, be a little bit slower when, uh, when you have this box uh, ticked. So it's really up to you which uh, method you would like to use. I would recommend that you just pick one and stick to it. Use that for your publication or for your you know, comparisons. Um, both are published. So again, it's really up to you which one you want to decide on. Now for setting the constraints, you can see here that we can constrain both the G1 and G2 peaks. And then we can also constrain the width of those histograms. So not only can we tell Flojo where it should look for the different peaks, but we, we can also tell it how wide each peak should be. So normally what I will do here is I will start with a sample that has random, uh, random cycling cells if I can see a G1 peak and a G2 peak quite easily. If I cannot see one or the other easily, I normally will go to my um, you know, G1 control or my G2 control and start, uh, start setting constraints on those controls and then fill in the other information as I play around with um, the different constraints on different samples. So for this, with the random cycling uh, population, it's very easy for me here to see the G1 peak as well as the G2 peak. So this is a decent sample to begin with. And all you have to do is click and drag inside the platform itself. A menu will appear and you can say constrain G1 range. And then this will lock Flojo into looking essentially only within the shaded area here to find where the G1 cells ought to be. Okay, you can do the same thing for the G2 peak. You just simply click and drag and then tell it that you want to constrain the G2 range to be somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, now, once I've constrained these, I keep an eye on the RMSD value here because, again, remember what we want to shoot for here is a low a value as possible or a low a value as possible to where we get to an inflection point where making changes to the model doesn't really severely increase or decrease the RMSD. Okay, so <clears throat> another constraint that I would normally encourage you guys to apply is the CV of the G2 peak. So you can see here that the G2 CV is about five and a half, whereas the G1 CV is seven. Now, if it was an ideal world, we would expect that the error, which is essentially what we are witnessing here, which is the CV of the uh, G1 peak, we would expect that the error associated with measuring cells in G1 would be the same as the error that we expect to see for cells that are in G2, right? Just because cells are in G2, the cytometer shouldn't encounter any more error than it does with G1. So what should happen here is the G1 CV and the G2 CVs should be the same. Again, because A, we're staining to saturation. So all cells are stained to the fullest extent with uh, the dye possible, right? So there's usually excess dye floating, uh, floating around and there's no DNA that is not uh, bound to the DNA dye. Um, and there's no reason for the cytometer to suddenly increase its amount of error just because cells are in G2. So therefore, these two CVs should be the same. So normally what I will do here um, is go down to where it says G2 peak, follow this to the CV over here, and I'm going to tell it to make it be constrained to the G1 CV. Okay. Now, the minute I do that, you may notice that the RMSD value changes. So just be aware of whether it goes up or down, you know, how, how far, et cetera. 
Okay, with this constraint in place, now I can kind of play around with uh, the, the width of, of the G1 peak. This looks pretty good to my eye, but I can play around with the width of that uh, uh, G1 peak just to see how it influences my RMSD value here. So I'm gonna click the option where it says unconstrained here. It's a drop down menu and it allows you to choose a value um, other than uh, what was determined by the model in the beginning. Now, when you click N initially, it reverts this value to one and it kind of blows up your plot, but don't worry about that. So this will allow us to kind of play with different values. So you hit five and then hit the enter key and you can see, okay, well, if my CV is set to five, you can see that my histogram here is a little bit narrow and my RMSD value is right around five, which is worse than what it was when we were uh, at seven. So I may want to change um, this right to six, for example, and you can see the wider I'm making this, I'm starting to get back into the threes with the RMSD. Um, if I go up to seven again, I should be around uh, less than, well, here we are, less than three and a half. What happens if we continue to go in the opposite direction? So let's say we're going to make it now seven and a half. Okay, when I make it seven and a half, notice that the RMSD value does not change, right? We're still at 336. What if I make this eight, right? Now we're starting to go in the opposite direction, right? We've got it down to 336. We're starting to move up in uh, to over three and a half now. And if I go to nine, right, I expect that that value is going to continue to increase. So somewhere between seven and eight, our I ideal value lies. And I thought, you know, seven was not bad. That's what the model began with. And as I said, you know, if you move it up to eight, it doesn't change things too much. So somewhere around here is probably the ideal situation for um, the model. Now it's important to note that we're only paying attention to the RMSD value on the random cycling population, the one that we're using to define all the cell cycle phases for all of the other samples, right? We want to set the constraints on the ideal sample and then apply these constraints to all the other samples um, so that you know, we know exactly where all the different phases uh, are or where all the different phases lie, okay? Now, when looking at the RMSD value, once you've set all the constraints here and if you apply this to other, the other samples, you no longer need to pay attention to the RMSD value that's on those samples because what you've done is you've constrained the model on all your other samples to the ideal situation. So we want to finalize everything here and then apply it to all the other samples and then not worry about uh, this particular statistic anyway regarding the, uh, the test samples. Okay, so I have the ranges set up and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna copy this to the rest of my samples. The way we do that is by simply selecting the node here, and then you can drag and drop it onto the um, group, in this case, right underneath the cleanup gate that I set up so that essentially we're looking at all the same level in the hierarchy across all samples. Now, there are some other uh, boxes in the menu here that I'll describe very quickly. Within the graph itself, if you want to draw the model sum or not, right? if you don't want that pink line, you can untick that box. These are all ticked by default. Um, drawing the individual components, I don't really see the value in, in getting rid of these guys because, I mean, it's nice to visualize all the different phases. And then whether or not you want those components filled or not, that's really up to you, right? It's just tinting of those, uh, of those histograms. The last box is this one that says cell cycle gates in workspace, okay? This is a really useful feature when you want to compare visually the 
S phase, let's say, of one sample versus the next, or perhaps the G1 or the G2 phase of, a, of you know, your control, let's say, versus other samples. But it's only to give you a visual representation of those phases. Do I have more or less cells in um, one phase or the other? And how can I, easy, how can I visualize that information easiest? Probably using the CC gates in the workspace is going to allow you to do that. I should note that the values here, when you tick this box, right, are going to be different than the values that you see in the model itself. Now, remember, the model here, all of these numbers are mathematically determined. And usually these are the numbers that you're going to want to use when you are, you know, generating some sort of publication, because this is what is being mathematically derived. The stuff that you see in the workspace here as a result of ticking this box, you'll notice that these values do not match what you have over here, okay? And the reason is these gates that are created are gates with very hard lines, right? They have a definite beginning bin and a definite ending bin, whereas the mathematical model, you can see they're nice tapered histograms, right? We have uh, values that are sort of you know, spread out over a larger um, over a larger area, and therefore, again, these are mathematically determined. They're not determined by um, gates that are placed on uh, on the data that are bent. So, don't worry that these values are not the same. It's just useful if you are going to uh, compare different phases to one another. So, I'll show you how to do this um, in a moment. I'm going to go ahead and copy this node again to the um, uh, to the group so that now all of my samples will have those cell cycle gates attached to them and it makes my life a lot easier when I get into um, the layout editor for example. Okay so if you want to make comparisons you know between samples or um, preview, you know, what the data look like across all samples. You can do that in a lot of different ways. You can flip through the cell cycle platform if you want, or you can simply drag the cell cycle node into the layout editor here. You get all your statistics in this little panel on the right, right, with the name of the sample in the bottom here. You can click the batch button or tell this to iterate by samples such that you can rotate right through each uh, through each sample that exists in your uh, in your workspace. So you can see I have a few samples here that are really ugly with respect to the distribution right of the S phase. Some some sort of inhibitor was used and the cells were released from that inhibitor. And we can see that we have enormous S phases for some of these samples. Okay. If you want the full batch report for that, you can just click the button. Eh, let's leave it three by three. I guess this will be okay. It's not a very big uh, workspace. But when you click the batch button, it essentially gives you the output right, of the cell cycle model for, again, each of the files, but kind of in a, in a layout, right? So you can see all of them rather than sort of flipping through uh, one by one. You can overlay different cell cycle models. So again, if you want to take the entire cell cycle, drop it in, and then maybe compare this to, let's say, I think it was the very first sample that was really ugly. You can take this, drag and drop it on top, right? And then you have both cell cycles modeled on top of one another. To me, this is not as, I don't know, visually useful because it's hard to tell where the first sample is and where the second, you know, where does the first sample end and the second sample begin. So again, it's probably going to be easier to use the cell cycle created gates. So you can, for example, you can take, uh, in this case, the G1 of uh, your condition number A1, and you can compare that if you want to uh, G1 coming from your um, control sample, right? And you can do the same thing for uh, the S phase. 
and G2 if you would like. So actually, let's do it this way. So the color scheme is always the same. Blue in this case is always going to be my control. And uh, the test sample is going to be in red. Right? And then we can come back here and do again this time. Sorry, this is the S phase. The other one was G2. Right. This way, it makes it a little bit easier, I think, to make visual comparisons between, um, between the samples. Oh, I screwed up the order here. You can see I've got blue for my test sample and red for my control. But nonetheless, you can actually see that, you know, you can visualize the differences between the samples, at least in terms of the cell counts. Obviously, the gate should be in the same location because we've constrained the model to have the G1 uh, phases in the same location. So there's a bin that beyond which these cells will not occupy. Same thing for the G2 and uh, S phases as well. Okay, you can modify things about the plots if you want. By double clicking on the plot, you'll get this graph definition window. Here you can change you know, labels. For example, the x-axis, if you don't want it to say FL4, you can just say, this is my DAPI or my DNA content. Um, let's put DNA content. It's a little bit more interesting than DAPI, right? And then this will go ahead and change that, that out to um, what you want. You can normalize the y-axis if you'd like, but this to me kind of defeats the whole purpose of overlaying these guys in this visual anyway. If you normalize and basically um, it gets harder to tell the differences between the G1 and the, the G1, in this case, of each uh, sample. Okay, and then on top of that, you can take these data and you can put them into the table editor. So the layout editor is here. And the table editor is this guy that's right next to the L, but you can do the same thing. You can drag and drop your cell cycle node directly into the table editor and it will put all of the statistics that are in the platform, right? This little platform, all the statistics that are contained here just basically being dumped into the table. And then in the table itself, if you want, you can highlight all of these guys and you can make a heat map if you want of the table, click the little cog icon in the upper right and you get a table displaying all your statistics with them heat mapped. We can clearly see that in our drug treated conditions, the S phase is quite large in comparison to the S phase coming from the control samples, right? And you can always, you know, rearrange the columns here so that you look at them, you know, from high to low or low to high, however you want to do it. Um, and of course, you can go by name if you want to, uh, just by double clicking in the name column. Okay, and then from here, if you want to save this table, you click on the file tab and say save as. I would recommend that you save it as a CSV file. Um, you can also just do a control C, control V when this window is in the forefront. You don't have to even drag, you know, your mouse around or anything, just uh, control C, control V. And the last, I should mention that when you're in this table editor view, you can change the options of where the table goes. So again, if you wanted to produce a CSV file, you can change it here, but you can also park the table um, next to your layouts. So um, if you want those stats kind of displayed next to your figures, you can say to current layout, gives you a warning here. And now you can take this table and you can display it in a report right next to whatever plots you wanted to put forward in your, in your layout. Okay, and I should mention too that the layout, you can export this information by simply going to the file tab, go down here to where it says export image, and you can export this as a PDF, SVG, or TIFF. The latter three options here are good for publication, right? Because the journals are usually asking for higher resolution images anyway. So the latter four options are what I would stick with. Uh, forget the top four, just do the bottom. Um, and then you can also, um, you can also change 
you know, instead of batching directly to Flojo, you can actually batch to a PDF. You can make a PowerPoint if you want. My favorite option is batching to printer. You click on the batch report option here when this is set to printer. And that will bring up your print spooler, which is pretty cool because when you're in your print spooler, you can come here and say, oh, I really want, you know, so many per column, so many per row. And it completely ignores the little dashed lines that are in the layout editor here. Um, so you don't get anything cut off. And then when you go to print this, you have an option to uh, save this as a PDF, right? So you have the option to save as PDF, you get the hard copy, and of course you can retile um, the data. So that's why I like the batch to printer option, but again, it's entirely up to you what you, what you wanna do. If this is the ideal sample, right? Or maybe, I don't know, it was sample B2 that you're trying to really, you know, drive home the point on. You could just take this graph and be like, okay, I want this export image. I want the PDF, the TIFF, whatever. Or you can just copy and paste it if you want directly into, uh, into PowerPoint. Okay. And then once all of your analysis is done here, you can save your work by clicking on the file tab, say save as, and then you can save it as a workspace or as an archival cytometry standard file. ACS is really nice because this will embed the FCS files in the workspace. And of course, all of your dates and stuff that you have will be saved with it. And so if you wanna share it with your boss or share it with some collaborators, it's much easier to share this type of file than it is the workspace, simply because the workspace uh, does not record the, it, doesn't, it does not embed the FCS files. It just in, records where these are located on your hard drive. So if you wanna share files and you're trying to share a workspace file, you need to not only send the workspace, but you also need to send the FCS files. Otherwise the user um, will not be able to, uh, to, to, to see what was, you know, what you gated on, et cetera. Okay, so with that, I will, um, I will take any questions that you have. I uh, hid the floating controls for a moment there, but that essentially concludes the, the um, cell cycle platform um, and how to use it in Flojo. Um, there is a question here. Please explain again why the numbers don't match for G1, G2, and S. So the numbers that are not matching are these ones, right? So you have the numbers that are generated in the platform itself, right? So here we have G1, we have S, and we have G2. And then this is said to be uh, 7, 68, and 7. Right, so here, if we come to condition, this is condition A2, if we actually look at the values that are contained within the, um, the actual hard gates that it creates, you can see that the values are different, right? Here for the S phase, we have uh, 48, right? And then we have 22 and 19. And the reason that they are different is because the platform here that you are using this generates these numbers mathematically, again, using either Watson or Dean Jet Fox. We're assuming Gaussian distributions right, of the G1 and the G2 phases. And then in the case of Watson, it's a subtractive model to figure out what is happening um, between, uh, between the two. But again, you can see that the model, right? The model, the values that the model has to work with are underneath the blue, or sorry, the blue, the uh, pink line, right? That is the data or the numbers essentially that the model has to work with. The black line represents the actual data, the raw data that you have. What Flojo attempts to do is best fit the pink right? Everything under the pink with everything under the black. And that value is reflected here in the, in the RMS, uh, the RMSD value. But it is also the reason why these two numbers, the two sets of numbers will not be the same, okay? These are hard generated gates where Flojo says, okay, well, wherever this area is 
shaded on this scale. We're going to, you know, take cells from here to here, and that's it. No tapering or anything like that. It's just taking what falls into this rectangle. Whereas you can clearly see that the model, right, has a much more uh, sort of spread out distribution of, uh, of the cells. So don't expect these numbers to, to be matched up with one another. Mathematically generated versus hard, what I like to call hard gates, right? Hard rectangles. Okay, so there's a question here. If there is a shift in the DAPI spectrum across samples, it is okay to create different gates for the samples based on where the populations are. So in general, I would say no to that question because what you're doing in the experiment is you're setting your, you're basing your analysis of the cell cycle based on some control, right? And then you're trying to make, um, you're trying to evaluate, you know, just how big the S phase or the G1 phase or the G2 phases are relative to that control. If you're shifting the model around, then you, you're losing the basis for comparison. So I would say no, um, but I know what you're talking about and I've experienced the same thing when I was a postdoc, when treating the cells with certain types of drugs, for whatever reason, the, you know, the G1 and G2 phases of the cell would either shift to the right or shift to the left. And um, I would really, oftentimes I would notice those changes would occur when the media that was in those plates changed color. So, you know, when I had kind of an orange or a yellowish color, that shift would change. And I assume it has something to do with the accessibility of the DNA to the DNA intercalating dye. It either goes up or down um, as a result of increased acidity of the media. Um, so I would you know, my advice to you is try to replicate the conditions, literally the physiological conditions that the cells are being exposed to. So, you know, if you're treating with a drug and it causes the media to turn yellow immediately, then you need to find a vehicle that does the same thing and then use that as the vehicle. Um, because otherwise, again, we're just sort of using the model to kind of roughly describe where the, you know, what the conditions or what the phases are but we don't have a really strict or good description of what they ought to be. Okay, and so the second question there is also when using EDU to look at the S phase, do you still recommend using the cell cycle tool to compare the S phase population across samples? No, if you have EDU or BRDU in your um, experiment, I would actually use, uh, use that marker in conjunction with the DNA dye to determine the, <laughs> the different phases because Two markers, right, is better than one, always. So just use your um, your secondary that the, use those those two markers in conjunction with one another um, to to analyze the DNA. You're going to get more accurate uh, values coming from that than you will when you use one marker, even if you're using a mathematical marker such as or a mathematical model such as this uh, to evaluate it. Okay, uh, you have not mentioned doublet exclusion. Is it with uh, within the cell cycle analysis? If so, which parameters is it based on? Yes, so I kind of mentioned that in the beginning. And um, unfortunately in this data set, I do not have uh, the ability to discriminate between doublets. So you can see here that I have only forward scatter, the height and the side scatter height uh, parameters. I don't actually have, um, I need the area and height, or I need the width parameters here in, in addition to the height in order to be able to do doublet discrimination. So normally what I would do is yes, gate my cells, then I would gate down uh, my doublets. I would get I would get rid of my doublets. So I'd gate down the single uh, singlet population, usually having forward scatter either area or width on the x-axis and uh, forward scatter height would be my y-axis. Um, and then I would, you know, I would uh, identify the cells that are, you know, primary single stain or the uh, singlet uh, population. So yeah, you don't want doublets in there because obviously doublets are going to contribute to either 
an increased G2 uh, phase, or you're obviously going to have a, a higher uh, a number of cells that are going to be sort of polyploid, right? You might have more uh, eight ends incorporated. So let me bring up a workspace here so you can quickly see what I would do for singlet, um, you know, singlet or doublet discrimination. So normally what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna isolate my, ah, I need to hide the floating controls here. Uh, da, 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 so I can move my graphs around. So normally I would create a gate right on my, uh, in this case, the lymphocytic cells. And then I may come from here and then do area, right? Forward scatter area versus forward scatter height. And then I would isolate the cells here that are the single cell suspension. So something like this, the fuzz that sort of falls off to the right here. These are cells that are, that are doublets, you know? <clears throat> so hopefully that um, helps you, uh, Mal Gorzada. All right, you're all welcome. Please uh, let me know if you have any other um, questions. Oh, I see there's another one popping up here. So I am happy to answer any of these questions that you may have. Um, so this question here from Yang is, if the Gappy of the tested cell line has two populations, a large number of small cell populations and a few large cell populations. Is it necessary to set a gate to separate them and detect the cell cycle separately? Otherwise, Flojo cell cycle shows that G2 has a long tail behind it, if not separated, and often fails to analyze the cell cycle number of each phases. Okay, so I think what you're alluding to here, Yang, is that you may have some strange you know, distribution of cells. And in your case, what it sounds like to me is that you're actually capturing, um, when you're initially gating your populations, you're probably gating, um, you know, you're at this stage where you have forward versus side scatter, but you may have, I don't know why you would have cells that have different DNA contents, unless you're looking at maybe, um, uh, I don't know, you know, let's say you're looking at, at mammalian cells and uh, I don't know, fungus that infects those mammalian cells at the same time, in which case you would see, you know, the DNA distribution for the fungus as well as the DNA distribution for uh, the mammalian cells. And then they would appear here as two, uh, you know, as two sort of uh, sets of, <laughs> two sets of, of peaks, right? You have two sets of G1 peaks and two sets of G2 peaks, et cetera. Um, in that case, that's a very good question. We would want to isolate the, you know, we would wanna isolate the fungal cells away from the mammalian cells in that case and analyze their cell cycle uh, distributions um, separately, okay? But if yours is not, the situation where you're using, so here you're saying that it's a tested cell line has two populations, a large number of small populations and a few large cell populations. So I'm guessing the large cell populations could be either doublets, right? Or the small cell populations that you have are debris or dead cells that are sort of contaminating the, um, contaminating the, um, the setup. If in any case, if you would like to discuss this in more detail, Yang, I'd be very happy to look at your data. Um, you can send me an email. I'll just put it in here. Send an email to jack.flojo at bd.com if you'd like me to take a look at it. Remember, either send me an ACS file or send me all of the FCS files that you have plus the workspace that you're using. And then I'd, you know, I'll go ahead and take a look at, at what you have there. But offhand, without actually seeing the data, it's hard to tell what these populations um, would be. And it doesn't make biological sense that you would have so many varied distributions of 
you know, of, of cells, especially if they're all coming from the same cell line, right? Unless you're killing the cells or you're doing something to damage the DNA of those cells, not exactly sure why you would be witnessing such things. Um, the recording of this session, let me show you where the recording is going to show up, okay? You guys will, will not get it in your... Um, you will not get it in your email inbox or anything. Um, if you just go to flojo.com or even flojo exchange, it doesn't matter. Um, you will notice that there's this, um, there's this tab, right? So if you're at flojo.com, you go to learn, right? There's all these tabs here and they all have these little drop downs and you go to webinars, which is where I assume all of you went today to find this, all right, once you get to this page, I'm gonna close the question box real quick. Um, at the bottom of this page, or at least towards the bottom, you'll see in a not very well lit up button, but there's a button here that says recorded webinars. If you click on that, it is going to be populated to the list of, of webinars here. It'll probably be posted you know, sometime like an hour or two from now. Um, and so you can, you know, you can uh, obviously review at your, uh, at your um, discretion, but this is where it will be located. Okay. So flojo.com, you go to learn, go to webinars, and then on the webinars page is a button for uh, recorded um, webinars. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to, I need to go back to. Uh oh, did I lose everybody? I need to go back to the Flojo interface here and I need to, come on Zoom. I just minimized that and shoot. Guys, I can't tell if I'm still recording or not. And nothing appears on my page. So start again. <laughs> I mean, I should be already in it. Problem is I can't see my, oh, there they are. Never mind. <laughs> Ridiculous. I had to hit the uh, missed, uh, I couldn't tell because I hid the <laughs> I hid the notifications. Anyway, okay. All right, I'm glad it's still recording. Uh, let's see, da, 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 da. we'll receive a recording of the session, as I mentioned, um, you will, okay. Uh, could it be that the cell line is instable and it becomes polyploid. Oh, sure. Yeah, you definitely could have a polyploid uh, population of cells, in which case I would not use the uh, Flojo cell cycle platform to try and model polyploid um, populations simply because we don't have it. Uh, we don't have a, the mathematical model for that. But there is a program, I think it's called a ModFit, that um, does have additional mathematical models when you want to model polyploid cells. So definitely, um, definitely could use that. So yeah, thank you, Erwin, for that uh, suggestion. It's, you're spot on. I didn't even think about polyploid cells um, in the context of Yang's, you know, Yang's question. All right. Um, okay. Any other questions? I see one in the Q&A box, so I'll answer that one. It says, how do you prepare cells for a more accurate experiment? Do you use cell media with serum deprivation? Oh, I didn't even think of that. Serum deprivation is another way to get cells locked into a uh, G1 phase. So yes, you can do, uh, you can use serum deprivation to get cells into G1. Just be careful when you deprive them of serum. Um, a lot of times if you're using a cell line, uh, you need to have some serum in it, right? Like 0.1% or 0.5%, something like that, where it keeps them hungry, but not enough so that they can actually cross into um, S phase. If you don't include serum at all, a lot of times uh, cell lines will die uh, 
um, as a result of starving them. So a uh, good idea to, to make sure that you at least have some serum in the media. But you can prepare the cells, Amanda, in a lot of different ways. Um, you can use an inhibitor like uh, mimosine or thymidine. Use a double thymidine block if you want to block the cells in early S phase, right? Late G1. Um, you can block them in G2 if you want using the, the microtubule inhibitors. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to do, like what you're trying to evaluate about your, you know, about your cells. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and say that question was answered live. And click done. Okay, are there any other questions? I'll give it maybe another minute here. Um, looking at the chat box and then I will bid you all a good afternoon. Have a good weekend. Thanksgiving coming up. Okay. All right, you're welcome. You're all very welcome. Thank you for the uh, kind words. If you want my slide deck, by all means, you can send me an email as well because I know that that will not um, uh, that will not be available later. Is it possible to observe increase of cells in G1, G0 phase, even if other tests shows increase in proliferation rate? Yeah, it's possible. So you can have a lot of, a couple different situations there. Possible to observe an increase of cells in G0, even if other tests shows an increase in proliferation. Yeah. So you can have cells, some cells that are entering into, you know, the cell cycle and are actually proliferating. Um, and then your G, you know, as a consequence of the cells moving through the, the cell cycle, eventually they're going to return back to G0. Uh, but it's possible that only a, a, a fraction of your cells are actually entering into um, entering into the cell cycle. And each time those things go in, one daughter could enter into the cell cycle again, and the other daughter could exit out of it and sit in G0, G1, you know, indefinitely, right? So long as one daughter is, is proliferating, then you, you could have that situation. You could also have another situation where, um, you know, you have polyploid cells, so cells that you know, endo reduplicate their um, DNA, they continue to pro progress and become polyploid. In that scenario though, I don't know that your G1 would necessarily increase unless you're, let's say you're just monitoring your sort of euploid population. Um, that expands um, along with your polyploid populations, but that would, you know, you would see a commonality there. They'd be correlated with one another. Uh, but it's definitely possible that you have only a fraction of your of your proliferating cells are actually doing it. It's not the whole culture that's moving forward, just a just a, a few cells that are equipped to do so. Um, the email yang is jack.flojo um, at bb.com. So I'm going to type it in here in the chat box. So if you're reading the chat box, you can see my um, email listed there. Okay, and again, I'll wait a few minutes here to see if there's any other um, any other questions. And if not, again, I bid you all a very good uh, good weekend and a happy Thanksgiving to those of you that are in the U.S. coming up next Thursday. All right, questions going once.
questions going twice. I kind of wish Zoom had this, you know, those little bubbles like Apple does, right? Or the iPhone does when you know that somebody is typing a message. So you know whether to hang on or not, because I don't have any <laughs> visual indication that that you are furiously typing away uh, a large, you know, involved question. All right, going three times. It's been two minutes now, at least according to my clock, maybe a minute, one minute and one second, because it went from 824 to 825. I don't exactly know when I started looking. But I'm going to say uh, you guys have been a great group. And uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Take care, everyone.